In this lecture, we will study the signal impairments that affect data and data transmission. We will begin by reviewing the difference between analog and digital signals, then we will look at how data is implemented. Finally, we will look at some real-world examples. In a communication system, data are propagated from one point to another by means of electromagnetic signals. Both analog and digital signals may be transmitted on suitable transmission media. An analog signal is a continuous electromagnetic wave that may be propagated over a variety of guided and unguided media. As the figure shows, analog signals can be used to transmit both analog data represented by an electromagnetic signal occupying the same spectrum, like voice sound waves, and digital data using a modem, which is a modulator or demodulator. A modem converts binary data to an analog signal by encoding the digital data onto a carrier frequency. However, an analog signal will become weaker or attenuate after a certain distance. To achieve longer distances, the analog transmission system includes amplifiers that boost the energy in the signal. Unfortunately, the amplifier also boosts the noise components. With amplifiers cascaded to achieve long distances, the signal becomes more and more distorted. For analog data, such as voice, quite a bit of distortion can be tolerated and the data remain intelligible. However, for digital data, cascaded amplifiers will introduce errors. A digital signal is a sequence of voltage pulses that may be transmitted over a wire medium. For example, a constant positive voltage level may be represented by a binary zero, and a constant negative voltage level may be represented by a binary one, or vice versa. As shown in the figure, digital signals can be used to transmit both analog signals and digital data. Analog data can be converted to digital using a codec, which is a coder-decoder. A codec takes an analog signal that directly represents the voice data and approximates that signal by a digital bitstream. At the receiving end, the bitstream is used to reconstruct the analog data. Digital data can be directly represented by digital signals. A digital signal can be transmitted only a limited distance before attenuation, noise, and other impairments endanger the integrity of the data. To achieve greater distances, repeaters are used. A repeater receives a digital signal, recovers a pattern of ones and zeros, and retransmits a new signal to overcome attenuation. As we already discussed, in addition to being represented by an analog signal, data can also be represented by a digital signal. As a matter of fact, it is easier to present data as digital since it commonly has two levels, 0 and 1. For example, in a top figure, figure A, an 8-bit data can be sent in one second where a bit of 1 can be encoded as a positive voltage and a bit of 0 as 0 voltage. Therefore, we have a bit rate of 8 bits per second. However, a digital signal can actually have more than two levels. In this case, we can send more than one bit for each level as shown in the lower figure, figure B. Level 1 sends bits 0, 0, level 2 sends bits 0, 1, level 3 sends bits 1, 0, and level 4 sends bits 1, 1. By this, we can double the bandwidth to carry more information since the high and low levels are divided into multiple levels. Here we are transmitting 16 bits in one second making the bit rate 16 bits per second. To put this in a real-life example, a user could subscribe to both the internet and TV services at the same time. In this case, the service provider could send X bits for the internet service and Y bits for the TV service. Let's look at a following example to compute how many bits are needed per level in a digital signal. Assume that we have a digital signal with eight levels. Then, to calculate the number of bits needed per level, we solve the equation of log base two of eight, 
since we have eight levels and two binary bits of 0 and 1. If you don't remember how to solve these types of equations, here's a quick refresher. We will need the exponential form of the logarithm. For example, if we have log base b of x equals y, this is basically equivalent to solving b to the y power equals x. This is true with any base b. Okay, back to the example. Thus, we need to solve log base 2 of 8 equals x. So basically, we are solving 2 to the x equals 8 and solving for x. Thus, x equals 3 because 2 to the third equals 8, which means that each signal level is represented by 3 bits. For example, each bit could represent certain data such as internet, TV, and IP phone, similar to the example in the previous slide. In this example, we will see how to calculate the required data rate of an object character reader, or OCR, in a scanner to convert text into a digital document. Assume that a scanner with an OCR needs to scan a text document at the rate of 100 pages per minute. Let's assume that on average, a page is 24 lines with 80 characters per line. Each character is 8 bits. To compute bit rate, we multiply the 100 pages per minute by 24 lines per page, by 80 characters per line, by 8 bits per character to get 1,536,000 bits per minute, which is equivalent to 1.536 megabits per minute. As we can see from the example, data rate does not only apply to networks, but is also applied in device communication between its internal components. The principal advantages of digital signaling are that it is generally cheaper than analog signaling and is less susceptible to noise interference. The principal disadvantage is that digital signals suffer more from attenuation than do analog signals. The figure shows a sequence of voltage pulses generated by a source using two voltage levels and the received voltage some distance down a conducting medium. Because of the attenuation or reduction of signal strength at higher frequencies, the pulses become rounded and smaller. So, which is the preferred method of transmission? Well, the telecommunications industry and its customers say digital is the preferred choice. Many telecommunications facilities and intra-building services have moved to digital transmission and digital signaling techniques. Signals travel through transmission media, which are not perfect. The imperfection causes signal impairment. This means that the signal at the beginning of the medium is not the same as the signal at the end of the medium. What is sent is not what is received. For analog signals, these impairments can degrade the signal quality. For digital signals, bit errors may be introduced, such that a binary 1 is transformed into a binary 0 or vice versa. The three causes of impairment are attenuation, distortion, and noise. Attenuation is where the strength of a signal falls off with distance over any transmission medium. For guided media, this is generally exponential and thus is typically expressed as a constant number of decibels per unit distance. For unguided media, Attenuation is a more complex function of distance in the makeup of the atmosphere. Attenuation introduces three considerations. First, a received signal must have sufficient strength so that the receiver can detect the signal. Second, the signal must maintain a level sufficiently higher than noise to be received without error. Both the first and second considerations can be resolved by using amplifiers or repeaters. For the third consideration, attenuation varies with frequency 
which is particularly noticeable for analog signals. To overcome this problem, techniques are available for equalizing attenuation across a band of frequencies such as using loading coils that change the electrical properties of voice-grade telephone lines. This smooths out attenuation effects. Another approach is to use amplifiers that amplify high frequencies more than lower frequencies. In this figure, we can see what attenuation looks like in a signal and how amplifiers can help with this problem. Assume that point 1 is sending data to point 3. These points can be computers sending data to each other over a network. Looking at the data signal at point 2, we can see that there has been attenuation of the signal since the strength of the signal weakens because there is lower peak amplitude and thus less energy. Now, we need to strengthen the data signal so that it can reach point 3 by placing an amplifier. An amplifier is a device that regenerates and fixes the transmitted signal to reach the end point. You can look at an amplifier as a router, switch, or modem in a network. In order to understand attenuation and amplification of a signal, we need to look at the relationship between the transmitted signal and the received signal. The relationship that identifies attenuation or loss of power is defined as 10 log base 10 of the transmitted power signal or P sub 2 over the received power signal or P sub 1. Basically, this is the formula to calculate attenuation. This equation tells us the amount of power loss of the original signal over any transmitted signal. In this example, suppose a signal travels through a transmission medium and its power is reduced to one half. Thus, we can substitute P sub 2 as one half times P sub 1. Thus, the P sub 1s cancel out. So if we put 10 times log base 10 of 0.5 into a calculator and solve, we get negative 3 decibels. This basically means that a loss of 3 decibels is equivalent to losing one half the power. The ratio between the transmitted signal and received signal is dimensionless. This, however, does not give us a value with no meaning in terms of data or network transmission. Thus, we use decibels, represented by dB, which measures the amount of loss. This is identified from the previous formula as the 10 log base 10 of P sub 2 divided by P sub 1. Assume that we want to find the best place to place an amplifier so that the data signal can be transmitted from point 1 to point 4 successfully. We use the decibel to calculate the loss between points 1 and 2, which in this example is negative 3 decibels, and the loss between points 3 and 4 is also negative 3 decibels. Thus, if we place an amplifier with an amplification factor of 7 decibels in the middle of the transmission, this will make the overall signal 1 decibel, since negative 3 decibels plus 7 decibels plus negative 3 decibels equals 1 decibel. This means that the power of the transmitted signal is the same as the received signal. Sometimes the decibels used to measure signal power is in milliwatts. In this case, it is referred to as dB sub m, or decibel milliwatts, and is calculated by the formula decibel milliwatts equals 10 times log base 10 of P sub m, where P sub m is the power in milliwatts. If we want to calculate the power of a signal with decibel milliwatts equals to negative 30, then we set the equation 10 times log base 10 of P sub m equal to negative 30 and solve for P sub m. To solve, we can divide by 10 on both sides to get log base 10 of P sub m equals negative 3. Then to solve for P sub m, we use the exponential form of the logarithm as we've seen previously, which gives us P sub m equals 10 to the negative 3 milliwatts.
Here's another attenuation or power loss example. The loss in the cable is usually defined in decibels per kilometer. Our problem is, if the signal at the beginning of a cable with negative 0.3 decibels per kilometer has a power of 2 milliwatts, what is the power of the signal at 5 kilometers? To solve this, we first compute the loss in the cable in decibels, which is 5 kilometers times negative 0.3 decibels per kilometer to give us negative 1.5 decibels. Then, using the power loss formula, we set the equation equal to negative 1.5 decibels. Divide both sides by 10 and use the exponential form of the logarithm to get p sub 2 over p sub 1 equals 0.71. Multiply both sides by p sub 1. Since the problem states that the signal at the beginning of a cable has a power of 2 milliwatts, we substitute this value into p sub 1 and solve for p sub 2, which is approximately 1.4 milliwatts. Delay distortion occurs because the velocity of propagation of a signal through a guided medium varies with frequency. For a band-limited signal, the velocity tends to be highest near the center frequency and fall off towards the two edges of the band. Thus, various frequency components of a signal will arrive at the receiver at different times, resulting in phase shifts between the different frequencies. Delay distortion is particularly critical for digital data because some of the signal components of one bit position will spill over into other bit positions, causing inter-symbol interference. This is a major limitation to maximum bit rate over a transmission channel. For any data transmission event, the received signal will consist of the transmitted signal modified by the various distortions imposed by the transmission system, plus additional unwanted signals referred to as noise that are inserted somewhere between the transmission and reception. Noise is a major limiting factor in communication system performance. Noise may be divided into four categories, thermal noise, intermodulation noise, crosstalk, and impulse noise. We will discuss the first two here, and the other two later on. Thermal noise is due to thermal agitation of electrons and is present in all electronic devices and transmission media. It is a function of temperature. Thermal noise is uniformly distributed across the bandwidth and hence is often referred to as white noise. Thermal noise cannot be eliminated and therefore places an upper bound on communication system performance and is particularly significant for satellite communication. When signals at different frequencies share the same transmission medium, the result may be intermodulation noise. The effect of intermodulation noise is to produce signals at a frequency that is the sum or difference of the two original frequencies or multiples of those frequencies, thus possibly interfering with services at these frequencies. It is produced by nonlinearities in the transmitter, receiver, in or intervening transmission medium. Thermal noise is the kind of noise that the transmitter and the receiver apply on a signal. A good example is a cell phone battery since it exerts noise on the transmitted and received signal. Thermal noise can be calculated by the equation n sub zero equals k times t, where n sub zero is noise power density measured in watts per hertz. K is Boltzmann's constant, which is 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23 joules per Kelvin, and T is temperature in Kelvin. In the previous formula, we are looking at noise measured in watts per hertz. However, noise is assumed to be independent of frequency. In order to measure the thermal noise in terms of decibel watts, or dBW, we apply the equation of n sub zero equals negative 228.6 decibel watts plus 10 times log of T plus 10 times log of W. So n sub zero 
is your thermal noise measured in watts. T is your temperature measured in Kelvin. And W is your bandwidth measured in Hertz. This helps us to overcome the thermal noise to achieve good reception in the transmission of data signals. Refer to example 3.4 on page 97 in your textbook for how to apply this formula. Basically, you will substitute the values given from the problem directly into the formula and solve. However, make sure you take note of the appropriate units before substituting into the equation. The other two categories of noise include crosstalk and impulse noise. Crosstalk is an unwanted coupling between signal paths. It can occur by electrical coupling between nearby twisted pairs or rarely coax cable lines carrying multiple signals. It can also occur when microwave antennas pick up unwanted signals. Typically, crosstalk is of the same order of magnitude as, or less than, thermal noise. As an example, if you are using the telephone and you hear another conversation, then you experience crosstalk. Impulse noise is non-continuous, consisting of irregular pulses or noise spikes of short duration and of relatively high amplitude. It is generated from a variety of causes, such as external electromagnetic disturbances like lightning and faults and flaws in the communication system. It is usually only a minor annoyance for analog data. However, impulse noise is the primary source of error in digital data communication. For example, a sharp spike of energy of 0.01 seconds of duration would not destroy any voice data, but would wash out about 560 bits of data being transmitted at 56 kilobits per second. The maximum rate at which data can be transmitted over a given communications channel under given conditions is referred to as the channel capacity. It depends on the data rate, bandwidth, average level of noise, signal to noise ratio, and error rate. The signal to noise ratio, or SNR, is the ratio of a signal power to the noise power corrupting the signal. Practically, all transmission channels are of limited bandwidth because of the physical properties of the transmission medium or from deliberate limitations at the transmitter on the bandwidth to prevent interference from other sources. We want to make as efficient use as possible for a given bandwidth. For digital data, this means that we would like to get as high of a data rate as possible at a particular limit of error rate for a given bandwidth. The main constraint on achieving this efficiency is noise. Nyquist considers a noise-free channel where the limitation on data rate is simply the bandwidth of the signal. The bandwidth is the limitation because of interference produced by delay distortion rather than noise. If the signals to be transmitted are binary or two voltage levels, then the data rate that can be supported by B hertz is 2B bits per second. However, signals with more than two levels can be used, meaning each signal element can represent more than one bit. For example, if four possible voltage levels are used as signals, then each signal element can represent two bits. If this multi-level signaling happens, then this becomes Nyquist's formula, which is C equals two times B times log base two of M, where C is Nyquist's capacity in bits per second, B is your bandwidth in Hertz, and M is the number of discrete signal or voltage levels. If all other things are equal, Nyquist's formula indicates that doubling the bandwidth doubles the data rate. For a given bandwidth, the data rate can be increased by increasing the number of different signal or voltage levels. The downside is that this places an increased burden on the receiver as it must distinguish one of M possible signal levels. Noise and other impairments on the transmission line will limit the practical value of M. Let's take a look at a couple of examples on how we can apply Nyquist's formula. 
Consider a noiseless channel with a bandwidth of 3 kHz transmitting a signal with two signal levels. We want to find the maximum bit rate. We know we need to use the Nyquist formula since this is a noiseless channel. Remember that Nyquist formula is C equals 2 times B times log base 2 of M. Since we know what the bandwidth and how many signal levels we have from the problem, we just substitute these values into the formula and solve for C. Remember that the bandwidth B is in hertz in the formula. Thus, we need to convert the given bandwidth of 3 kilohertz to hertz, so we just multiply by 1000 to get 3000 hertz. The signal level M is 2 given by the problem. So substituting these values in and solving the equation, we get 6,000 bits per second as the maximum bit rate. In this example, we need to send 265 kilobits per second over a noiseless channel with a bandwidth of 20 kilohertz. We need to determine how many signal levels are needed. Again, since we are dealing with a noiseless channel, we use Nyquist's formula. So C equals 2B times log base 2 of M. This time, we know the bit rate C, which is 265 kilobits per second. But remember, in the formula, C is in bits per second. So therefore, we first need to convert the 265 kilobits per second to bits per second. So multiply that by 1000 and we get 265,000 bits per second. We also know the bandwidth B, which is 20 kilohertz. But remember, B in the formula is in hertz. So again, multiply by 1000 to get 20,000 hertz. Putting these values into the formula, we see that we need to solve for L, the number of signal levels. If we multiply 2 by 20,000, we get 40,000, divide by 40,000 on both sides of the equation, and then we finally get log base 2 of L equals to 6.625. We solve for L, and thus our final answer is 98.7 levels. Real-world channels are not noise-free, as we have seen from Nyquist's formula. They also have limited bandwidth and limited power and energy of the input signal. The presence of noise can corrupt one or more bits. If the data rate is increased, then the bits become shorter so that more bits are affected by a given pattern of noise. Mathematician Claude Shannon developed a formula relating data rate, noise, and error rate. For a given level of noise, a greater signal strength would improve the ability to receive data correctly in the presence of noise. The key parameter involved is the signal-to-noise ratio, or SNR, which is the ratio of the power in a signal to the power contained in the noise that is present at a particular point in the transmission. This ratio is measured at the receiver and is usually reported in decibels. Basically, the SNR expresses the amount that the intended signal exceeds the noise level. A high SNR means a high quality signal and a low number of required intermediate repeaters. The signal to noise ratio is important in the transmission of digital data because it sets the upper bound on the achievable data rate. Shannon's result is the formula C equals B times log base two of one plus SNR where C is the capacity of the channel in bits per second, B is the bandwidth of the channel in hertz, and SNR is the signal-to-noise ratio. The Shannon formula represents the theoretical maximum that can be achieved. However, in reality, only much lower data rates are achieved because the formula only assumes white noise or thermal noise. Let's now take a look at a couple of examples on how we can apply Shannon's capacity formula. In this example, we consider an extremely noisy channel 
in which the value of the signal to noise ratio is almost zero. This means that the noise is so strong that we have a faint signal. We need to use Shannon's capacity formula because we are considering a channel with noise. Since we are given that the signal to noise ratio is zero, we substitute zero into SNR and solve the equation. We get B times log base two of one and log base two of one equals zero. So B times zero equals zero. This means that the capacity of this channel is zero regardless of the bandwidth. In other words, we cannot receive any data through this channel. This is a practical example of jamming a signal. In this next example, we want to calculate the theoretical highest bit rate of a regular telephone line. We are given that a telephone line normally has a bandwidth of 3000 and the signal to noise ratio is 3162. Since we are calculating theoretical bit rate, we again use Shannon's capacity formula. Substitute our given values of 3000 for the bandwidth B and 3162 for the SNR and solve for capacity C. Therefore, the highest bit rate for a telephone line is 34,860 bits per second. If we want to send data faster than this, we can either increase the bandwidth of the line, which is nearly impossible, or improve the signal to noise ratio, which is very hard. It is important to take note of these two different contexts when using the term bandwidth. Bandwidth can be represented in hertz and bits per second, but these have different meanings. When bandwidth is in hertz, this refers to the range of frequencies in a composite signal or the range of frequencies that a channel can pass as seen in the previous lecture. When bandwidth is in bits per second, this refers to the speed of bit transmission in a channel as seen in this lecture. It is also important to know the difference between when to use Shannon's capacity formula as opposed to Nyquist's equation. Shannon's capacity formula gives us the theoretical maximum capacity of the channel, while Nyquist's equation tells us how many signal levels are needed. More than two signal levels can be used, but increasing the signal levels may reduce the reliability of the communication system. In summary, we have looked at data transmission issues, terminology related to data transmission, such as frequency, spectrum, and bandwidth, types of signals in terms of being analog versus digital, and the various transmission impairments that may occur. We also looked at common formulas related to attenuation and computing channel capacity and studied examples on how to apply these formulas in a practical setting.